sir, you had a talk on pulmonary embolism and its management in the CSI 2016. Right. So, sir, uh, can I ask you how uh, commonly you see this kind of patients in your practice in, in country? I mean, it's not uncommon. The problem here is that uh, most often we miss because the patient presentations are very, very vague or uh, undiagnostic uh, presentations the patient comes with, usually with unexplained uh, palpitations or dyspnea or uh, loss of consciousness or falling saturations. And uh, until unless we have high index of suspicion, uh, most of these patients in ICU settings are missed because patients are already already either on ventilator or have been operated or uh, they are not conscious and uh, clinically they don't express many symptoms. So, I understand that clinically it is difficult to diagnose. So, what are the diagnostic modalities you choose to diagnose this patient, sir? So, apart from uh, uh, if a person has certain risk factors, uh, like the person is immobile, the person is having heart failure, the patient is having cancer or the patient has undergone surgery with a uh, abdominal tr uh, trauma or uh, leg bone trauma. These are the candidates uh, for development of pulmonary embolism uh, from the deep vein thrombosis. Deep vein thrombosis may be apparent or it can be inapparent. It may not be visible to the treating physicians. So, uh, once it becomes apparent uh, deep vein thrombosis, then chances of pulmonary embolism becomes very high. So, uh, once you have a patient like this, uh, the usual modality of diagnosis is uh, from simple investigation like uh, electrocardiogram which may be normal uh, in majority of the patients and uh, but there are certain specific changes in the electrocardiogram which will help us to make a diagnosis of pulmonary embolism these are s1 lq uh, Q3, T3 uh, changes uh, along with the right ventricular block and right ventricular strain if they are present. But uh, then may be non-diagnostic. The second uh, important investigation we often rule out or rule in is uh, D-dimer test. Now, D-dimer test is a more important negative predictive value rather than a positive predictive value because D-dimer gets raised in so many other conditions wherever there is injury, for example, trauma or a surgery. So, the D-dimer will be falsely positive. So, I think we cannot depend upon D-dimer in particularly in uh, confirming the diagnosis. The usual confirmation comes from CT pulmonary angiogram and if you have a multi-detector uh, CT scan, it can detect even smaller uh, thrombi in the pulmonary vasculature up to the sixth division of pulmonary artery and that is a very important uh, modality for diagnosis and if a patient has uh, uh, symptoms which are vague, which are not there but he has a risk factor, then the patient must be subjected to a CT pulmonary angiogram. Now, uh, uh, many times the patient presents uh, with a very large pulmonary embolization which is known as massive pulmonary thromboembolism. Now, in these patients, the patient often goes into shock or hypotension or patient has a falling uh, uh, oxygen level, SpO2 level. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the patients in whom uh, possibly pulmonary angiogram cannot be done. So, in those cases, bedside echocardiography should be done and echocardiography may show you the evidence of right ventricular dysfunction, right ventricular free wall hypokinesia, McConnell sign is there where the apex is cut contracting vigorously, but the right ventricular free wall is not contracting. Patient usually has tricuspid incompetence and you may be lucky to find a thrombus in the pulmonary artery main trunk or one of its branches with echocardiography. And uh, of course, if the patient has an implanted device, which is also a risk factor for development of pulmonary embolization, then uh, you might find uh, the device carrying the thrombus uh, inside the right heart, like a patient having a pacemaker wire. Right. So, uh, these are the uh, situations uh, where the diagnosis is most often made, but even if uh, it is required, the patient may be initially stabilized with vasopressors, with the uh, other modalities like intravenous. Uh, heparin which can be given and once the patient is little stabilized then the pulmonary angiogram must be achieved and once we do the pulmonary angiogram we are able to categorize the type of uh, pulmonary embolism which is there and once it is massive the only modality of treatment has the, the thrombus has to be removed right. and you can uh, remove the thrombus by thrombolysis by systemic th thrombolytic agents like uh, RTPA or uh, thanectiplase but even septokinase and urokinase are also mentioned in ESC guidelines to be used. So, these, these are the agents which are effective in a great extent in removing the thrombus and once the thrombus is removed from the pulmonary artery, the circulation is re-established and the right ventricle starts contracting well and the patient hypotension disappears. So, this is a very, very important modality for carrying out the treatment of uh, massive thromboembolism. Of course, if a patient is having an intermediate variety where the thrombus is not very large. 
uh, then of course these patients have to be on anticoagulants which can be low molecular ha weight heparin plus uh, vitamin K antagonist or of course um, somebody wants to use newer uh, oral anticoagulants like rivaroxaban or apixaban they can also be used along with the intravenous. The, the, uh, uh, this therapy has to be instituted as early as possible even if the thrombolysis cannot be given yes. uh, immediately the intravenous heparin must start because uh, it has a very short half life right. and we can always stop it for some time before giving the thrombolysis. So how do you choose uh, clinically who are the right candidate for thrombolysis? I think uh, the uh, definitive indication or class 1 indication according to European Society of uh, Cardiology guideline is are the patient who are in hypotension or shock. So they must be thrombolyzed right. and if there is a risk factor for which you cannot do the thrombolysis, for example a patient having intracranial hemorrhage recently or right. patient has undergone a major surgery right, or uh, the patient is having uh, other contraindication for thrombolysis, these are the patient in whom uh, the, the, the pharmaco-invasive approach can be carried out with the catheter. The catheter is moved near the or into the thrombus in the right. pulmonary artery uh, and uh, once the uh, it, it is inside the thrombus then 25 milligram of RTPA can be given. A very small dose of uh, tenectiplase can be given right into the thrombus. Now this will not lead on to bleeding which is likely to occur in pa these patients with systemic thrombolysis. Right. So uh, catheter directed thrombolysis is a well known modality the world over. So if there are contra contraindications for thrombolysis, systemic thrombolysis, then the patient can undergo a catheter directed thrombolysis and of course uh, uh, if, if the, the possibility of uh, is there that the thrombolysis has failed, right. then these patients might be even uh, uh, undergo surgical thrombolectomy. Right. So, th surgical thrombolectomy is also a modality which is described where the catheter expertise is not existent and the patient is very direly on ventilator or something like that and the patient can have a surgical thrombolectomy also. What is uh, your personal experience sir, in your clinical practice, we, what, we, what we, is the most we, we commonly get, used? Uh, we do get uh, these patients, uh, three or four cases in a month. Uh, we are running ICU in our uh, department and uh, these are the cases where we take the help of uh, 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 thrombolysis, systemic thrombolysis and uh, most of the time with place we use it, 40 milligram can be given. How is your experience with tenectiplase? I think they, they, we follow it up with the, uh, uh, the, the echocardiography and uh, even pulmonary angiogram uh, later on and uh, majority of these patients about 80-90% they, they resolve as far as thrombus is concerned and the, the hemodynamic improvement is immediate, it is visible immediately. Right, now sir. even uh, patients who are having intermediate thrombus formation, there are certain high risk criteria. Now those criteria are if the patient has right ventricle dysfunction or if the patient has cardiac biomarker which are disturbed, for example BNP is raised or anti-pro BNP is raised right. or troponin I is raised, all will tell, uh, tell us that there is a myocardial damage as well or uh, there is a myocardial stretch which is going on in the right side of the heart and uh, these are the candidates in whom also we have been doing thrombolysis although it is not a very definitive indication right. for doing thrombolysis uh, uh, but if it is intermediate variety with a high risk even then the thrombolysis should be carried out. Thank you sir. So thanks for such thoughtful insights. So what would be your concluding remarks on this topic sir? My concluding remarks is that uh, we should have high index of suspicion in a patient who has a risk profile for development of pulmonary embolism and time is very very important as we say time is muscle in the heart Absolutely. conditions. Here the diagnosis has to be very very prompt and Absolutely. appropriate thrombolysis followed by anticoagulation has to be carried out. Thank you very much sir. Commonly you see this kind of patients in your practice in, in country? I mean, it's not uncommon. The problem here is that uh, most often we miss because the patient presentations are 